So I think we are live now on YouTube. Uh, so welcome everybody to another edition of Physics Discussions Colloquium, an event that is promoted by ICTP Safer and EFT UNESP. Today, we are glad and honored to receive Dr. Blatico Vidral. Currently, he is a professor at the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford and National University of Singapore. Professor Blatico received his bachelor and PhD at Imperial College London, and his research focuses on quantum information science in a variety of angles that include different perspectives. Professor Blatico is a very active researcher with several works published that also include books in the area. So if you are, if you are watching on YouTube or here at Zoom, you can type your question on the chat and we are going to read during the colloquium. Once again, thank you, Professor, and the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you and I'm really excited to have this audience uh, of people who are interested in this kind of uh, research in, in fundamental physics and, and fundamental science in, in many ways. So what I want to tell you about is this trend where um, the effects that have for a long time been thought to be um, microscopic only, the quantum effects, are now actually being explored in the domain of macroscopic objects. Uh, with a view, of course, that um, uh, with, a, with a view that maybe we should be even asking the question of what it would mean really for the whole universe to be um, quantum mechanical. Um, and so the question really is, um, it's a fundamental question and it drives um, all of the things that I will be telling you about, is, is there a limit to how big an object can be and still be in a quantum superposition, if you like, still be able to interfere? And of course, the answer is we don't know. That's, that's really um, uh, the exciting part of the research in pro progress. Uh, but we can already ask question number two, of course, um, which is if there was a limit of that kind, then do we have anything um, to conclude about why this would be the case? And I think at present, um, we also don't know, but it seems that one obvious candidate is gravity. And I think you will be hearing a lot about uh, all sorts of things to do with collapsing of quantum mechanics due to gravity and so on. Um, I will tell you a little bit about this as well. Uh, gravity, of course, is, is an obvious um, uh, possible culprit simply because we don't really um, have a full um, quantum theory of gravity. Uh, but in fact, in my view, even at this level at which we can test things, gravity will also display um, quantum mechanical features. So I will tell you um, about it. But uh, let me describe some of these experiments that you will also possibly hear about maybe next week at the, at the meeting, which are to do with exploring interference effects of larger and larger um, systems. Um, and, and here are these famous experiments uh, that I think were very surprising in the late 90s. This is Marcus Arndt uh, working in Vienna, uh, who took this complex molecule, buckyball, um, and I think for a physicist, what's important really is that the size of this molecule, if you look at the diameter of the molecule, um, it's about a thousand times bigger than what we would call the De Broglie wavelength of the molecule. Um, and, you know, if you open a, a first year undergraduate textbook on quantum mechanics, then one of the criteria that people would say is that if the De Broglie wavelength is much smaller than the size of the system, you shouldn't expect the system to behave quantum mechanically. And this, of course, is completely wrong. Uh, you should probably throw away any book that says anything uh, like this. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, an awful lot that we've learned from this experiment. So what Marcus Sand really did, th these are, I think, um, groundbreaking experiments. They are very difficult. And, and Marcus has been scaling them up now. I think he can, uh, he can do something uh, of this kind with um, molecule that has 
10,000 atomic units, so much larger than the buckyball. Already buckyballs were surprising. So he would have a source of these molecules, he would collimate them here, and then he would send them at the diffraction grating, just like any uh, diffraction experiment that we do. And the question at the, this detection, uh, instead of a screen, you have a different method of detecting where these uh, molecules end up, but the story is basically the same and the mathematical description is the same. The question is, will you get an interference pattern uh, that you expect from quantum mechanical behavior or will these molecules just behave like classical objects, like classical particles, like bullets? And will they just end up behind each of these slits independently? And of course, these results are published in, in Nature. If you haven't read this paper, I highly recommend it. You can actually understand all of this with, with high school uh, physics. You, you don't need anything sophisticated, no Schrodinger equations even. Uh, all of this is really the Broly waves applied to a macro molecule, if you like. And as you can see in the top, the bottom, the bottom plot is simply just to show that when there is no diffraction grating, they are nicely collimated. The top plot is the one that you get from the diffraction grating, and you get exactly the wave-like um, interference pattern that you would observe from anything that has wave-like properties. So if you showed this uh, to someone without telling them um, what kind of object was undergoing interference, they really wouldn't be able to tell you. These could be photons, they could be electrons, they could be water waves, they could be anything in fact. Uh, and that's, as you know, the beauty of quantum mechanics that everything subscribes to exactly the same set of very simple principles. And the question that we have, of course, in our research is we know that this holds at the subatomic, at the nuclear, subnuclear level. We know that this holds at the level of more complex molecules. The question, like I said, is, is there an end to this kind of quantum mechanical behavior? And that's what drives um, a lot of this research. Now, this slide is a joke, of course. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't do um, an interference experiment with a living system. This is a, a crazy scientist who is shooting cats um, at two slits and then concluding that they do not interfere and therefore settling the problem of Schrodinger's cat. This is, of course, a joke. That's not what we mean by, by, um, by Schrodinger's cat experiment. Um, and um, but, but somehow it does communicate to you the trend of the direction in, in which we would like to go. And actually, I will tell you about, about this now. So very frequently when I give talks, um, I end up um, um, getting a question from, um, from a biologist uh, who says, um, the last century, 20th century, was known as the century of physics. We had many breakthroughs. We had um, quantum mechanics and relativity. But the biologists would always say, but this century is the century of biology. Um, now, I completely disagree with that. I think, um, um, unfortunately for biologists, this century will also be the century of physics. And in fact, this will be the century in which physics goes into more complex disciplines into chemistry and biology and explains things in the way that they should be explained through physics, does it properly, if you like. I think biology is too important, far too important to be left to biologists only. And that's kind of what I want to tell you about. So when I say macro domain, um, there are many phenomena. I will tell you a little bit about living systems, uh, but of course, gravity also falls within um, this macroscopic domain. And the question is really to explore all of these different aspects of this domain, because maybe something interesting and novel happens there. But even if nothing interesting happens, even if we end up confirming quantum mechanics, we are going to learn an awful lot 
about complex systems. Now, before I do that, because I gave you this joke, now I'm going to kill the joke like any physicist, and I'm actually going to explain it. I will give you um, a very rough argument why um, you, we will never be able to do diffraction um, with objects that are too big. And this is a beautiful argument that comes. So, so whichever way we confirm interference and superposition, it will not be done um, like what Marcus Arndt has been doing with his ma macromolecules. Of course, there are many other ways of confirming quantum effects, and that's the whole point of, of this. But there's a very beautiful argument due to Rosen and Paris. It's an old one, 1962, I think, FISREB. And what they say is the following. They say, take an object, take a, take a ten, could be any object of mass M and spatial extent S. I'm being very, very crude here. I'm doing a back of an envelope calculation. You can do a bit more formal one and you will get um, the same result to within a factor of, of, of two or pi or E or whatever, one of those numbers, right? So here you have a, here you have this molecule uh, or a complex physical system coming to a diffraction grating. You have the plane in which you detect these things some distance d away. V is the velocity of these objects and T is the time. Now, we all know that the condition, this is the so-called Fraunhofer condition, the far field condition, to see interference fringes clearly to get maxima and minima is that the distance d times the wavelength of this object is roughly comparable um, to the size of the object times the size of the slits. And I'm assuming that the slits are roughly of the same size as the object. Again, this is a somewhat crude approximation but I think it will work um, similarly with, with, with certain small factors of correction. So basically, you get a very simple relationship between distance and the wavelength and the size of the object. And what I'm then assuming is that the time I'm given to do the experiment is the age of the universe. So I'm being so generous that I want to give you the full time from the beginning of Big Bang up until now to do this kind of experiment. So th there is no more time in the universe than this. If you're surprised by this, I was surprised the first time I looked at it. It looks like a very small number. Uh, tend to say It makes you feel a bit claustrophobic in this universe, I think, but that's how old the universe is. And if you put this into the formula, you will get that um, an object of Planck's mass I'm choosing deliberately Planck's mass because it keeps popping up in, in all sorts of quantum gravity arguments. And the size of about um, 10 to minus 4 meters, so 10th of a millimeter, is the maximum you are ever going to be able to interfere. That's interesting because that object is not very big, like I said. And we are gradually, we are still very far away from that limit, but we are gradually approaching it. So it's interesting that, that even just due to the finiteness of our resources, space and time, finiteness of space and time, we simply won't be able to do, to do just anything that we want to do. Anyhow, let me tell you how people have gone into the, into the complex direction. So first I will tell you a little bit about quantum bias side of things because recently there has been evidence that quantum effects um, exist not just in inanimate complex matter that belongs to, to the domain of solid state, if you like, but also living systems are actually doing um, very, very small scale uh, type of information processing, S some kind of quantum computation, but you can think of it as quantum computations with very few uh, quantum bits. So this is a bird that's using um, entanglement. That's one of the theories that we have in order to um, tell the direction of the external magnetic field. So this is a bird that tends to migrate 
uh, before winter in, uh, in autumn from the northern European uh, plains down to Africa, and then six months down the line, it makes the same journey back. It's an incredible journey, 10,000 kilometers. Um, and it's actually incredible that these robins um, can um, do this kind of thing. And for a long time, it was suspected that they have some kind of compass, classical compass. And then this theory was um, disproven, actually, by a sequence of beautiful experiments. And I don't want to go into that too much now. Um, and the final conclusion, this is, of course, still research in progress, is that actually this bird is using some kind of um, spin entanglement effect which leads to different kind of chemistry uh, depending on the inclination of the external magnetic field. So the bird's brain ends up generating different chemicals depending on the angle that the magnetic field makes. And the mechanism actually relies on the dynamics of two electrons which are entangled as far as their spins are concerned. And depending on the kind of entanglement, whether you have the singlet or the triplet state, this will lead to different chemistry. And depending on the amounts of different chemicals that you get, the bird actually uses this in order to map out the magnetic field. So the bird sees the magnetic field the same way that we see things around us using light. It's a really remarkable story, in fact. Um, the other remarkable thing was about photosynthesis, namely the fact that, um, uh, that some ba um, bacteria um, can also use quantum dynamics in order to solve a problem um, of the following type. These are bacteria that usually live um, in environments that have very little sunlight. Uh, some of them would live 1,000 meters below the sea uh, level. Um, and you have a handful of photons reaching um, these depths uh, per hour. And so these bacteria have evolved to be ridiculously good at catching the photons. So this is an artist's impression of what the bacterium looks like. It's a mess, this molecule. You know, when you look at it as a physicist, you get a headache immediately. It's extremely messy. Um, but the bacterium has an antenna with which it captures a photon. And then the, the mysterious part for biologists was this protein, FMO complex. It's almost like a quasi one dimensional structure of this kind, which takes this energy from a single photon and puts it into the reaction center. And the reaction center then continues to use this energy to trigger the ATP cycle and to get even more energy. It's a bit like a thermodynamical engine. Um, in the reaction center, most of these processes are understood through chemistry, actually. So there's probably very little quantum mechanics required at the fundamental level. But the interesting thing for biologists for a long time was how does this uh, photon get from the antenna into the reaction center with almost 100% efficiency? And again, this is also work in progress. We don't really fully understand this. Um, we've done experiments with um, extracting the FMO complex, trying to excite it in its own right and see what kind of dynamics we get, whether we get any interesting quantum effects. And the group of Fleming has done many pioneering effects in that direction. So this is still work in progress. Um, we do suspect that there are quantum effects at play. So basically the dynamics between this end and that end is actually um, has a component of coherent quantum transport, which is what um, is supposed to lead to the higher efficiency of, 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 of these processes, simply because classical stochastic process can never give you um, anything with, with this very high degree of efficiency. So I'm just mentioning a couple of these directions. Like I said, um, these experiments are not the same 
um, as the experiments we do on single atoms in atomic physics, because these are very complex systems, they are much harder to control. The conclusions that we draw are also much more uncertain. But like I said to me, this just says, let's go for it and try to understand this uh, even better. So I think these are hugely exciting experiments. Now, what we did at Oxford, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we are planning to do. Um, I really like this direction because I think it's fantastic. Uh, what we did is we actually took a living bacterium. This is a friend of mine called Dave Coles, who worked with me a few years back at Oxford. Um, and what we thought is that rather than just using um, detached FMO complexes outside of bacteria, we thought what would happen if we take a living bacterium and put it inside a very small optical cavity. These two things you see here are two mirrors that are very, very close to one another. Sometimes you can even um, get them as close as a micron um, of one another. Um, and the idea of these two mirrors is they act as an optical resonator. So what you're trying to do is inject light, get light to couple to the bacterium for a while, bounce back and forth, and then come out from the other end, which is where you detect this. And from the detections that you make at this end, you can conclude what kind of dynamical process was happening here. And I put this, Dave, uh, I put this dramatic title, Dave Coles versus Niels Bohr, because Niels Bohr had, a, had an amazing, I, I'm not a big fan of Niels, Niels Bohr, um, as far as his interpretation of quantum mechanics is concerned. But I'm a big fan of Niels Bohr as far as his attitude to physics and to science was. I think he was great. So already in 1931-32, he starts speculating about quantum effects in biology. This was well before Schrodinger wrote his famous book on what is life in the 40s. This was some almost 20 years before Schrodinger wrote anything on this topic. So Bohr had all sorts of speculations about quantum complementarity being true even in the macroscopic domain. And one of the things he says in these lectures is that it seemed to him that there is a complementarity between something being alive and something being quantum mechanical. And this is a fascinating idea. I'm almost certainly wrong. And I think what Dave ended up doing proves that this is to, to a high degree wrong. But what Bohr thought is that either we are going to be able to do macroscopic experiments to confirm that something is alive. However, if we want to probe a living system at the microscopic level, this system can no longer be alive. That was his idea. You know, Niels Bohr saw complementarity in everything. So he was very adventurous. And like I said, it's probably not surprising that many of his ideas will ultimately prove wrong, but actually they are fantastic. They, they, they offer great motivation to a physicist to actually investigate these things. So what Dave did, here are the pictures of, um, how did, how did they, Dave actually had uh, one bacterium under the focus of the laser inside. He literally took one bacterium inside and coupled it very strongly to the light that exists uh, inside this cavity. So for those of you that know quantum optics a little bit, he actually created dress states between the energy levels of the bacteria and between quantized radiation in this cavity. And I will show you that in a, in a minute. So actually he created an entangled state between photons and bacteria while the bacterium was alive. And I think that's, that's really cool. I mean, he did it just for fun. You know, frequently biologists say, what's the point of this for biology? And I'm very honest, there is no point for biology at this stage. There are some interesting ideas for biology, but that's not why we did this. We did this just to show that quantum mechanics applies equally even to a living system. So here you can see these bacteria. You can actually, so how did he tell whether something was, uh, is alive? In fact, this, this was, this was a, a great debate that two of us had 
Um, I think uh, it started during one of the Friday afternoon pub sessions that I like to do with my group. I think we were sitting there and drinking and talking about all sorts of crazy things. Um, and actually, we had all sorts of ideas how to confirm this. And ultimately, what they decided to do is to inject a dye molecule into the sample, which the bacterium, if they are alive, they keep this molecule outside of them. They are maintaining their own integrity. Um, however, if the bacterium is dead, then this dye molecule, the purple molecule here, is able to penetrate inside the bacterium. And that's a very simple witness of the bacterium no longer being alive. And these are kind of the images that you get, uh, which are different from the bacteria transitions versus this dye molecule. To cut the long story short, the bacterium, what he was targeting is the energy level at which the bacterium absorbs light. Uh, this is this um, um, wavelength here. And then as when the photon is absorbed, it loses energy, it cascades down this chain of energy levels and it ends up ultimately in the reaction center where it triggers chemistry. And like I said, this is by and large possibly uninteresting to a quantum physicist, at least at this stage. So he was targeting this transition. And what he observed is that when he put the bacterium inside the cavity, because of the strong coupling between light and the bacterium, the energy levels were shifted. Each of these energy levels that he was tuning into to get his spec spectra out was actually slightly detuned. This is something that we call um, Rabi splitting, vacuum Rabi splitting. Um, and again, so th these are the images of some of these, uh, may maybe this last inset is the relevant one, where you have these two levels that if the systems were not coupled would actually cross each other as you change the distance between these mirrors. But because at some point you, you hit this sweet spot where they are very strongly in resonance, you get this signature splitting of these two levels. And actually Dave managed to do this for a sequence of different frequencies, while at the same time getting the signal that the dye molecule is still outside of the bacterium and therefore the bacterium was alive throughout this experiment. And actually they survived the experiment, you know, they were quite happy afterwards. I think they, they lived happily ever after. In fact, these bacteria probably can live forever, that there's nothing really that, that, that kills them in principle. You know, it's one of those systems. So now again, what's interesting for a quantum physicist is that uh, the state that we are describing, uh, the state that's highly entangled between light and bacterium, is actually one of those entangled states that we've been studying um, in our field uh, for a long time. And I, won't, I don't want to bore you about it. And actually, you can even plot an entanglement measure that's based on entropy, if you like. And you can even uh, plot this as a function of how strongly your light in the cavity is coupled to your system. And this actually even allowed us to estimate how strongly the bacterium was entangled to light. Like I said, the main point being that the bacterium was still alive. And now what we want to do, and I'm going to stop here with this part and tell you a little bit about, um, about the other domain of gravity, but, but what we are planning to do now, and I'm hoping that we will get um, being able to raise enough money um, to actually support this research. There are always some crazy people around who um, are willing to fund this kind of research. And I, I, think, I, I think that's very important. So what we want to do is really double the experiment. We want to have two cavities. We want to have a bacterium in each of these cavities. We want to send a single photon through an interferometer. So th this is a beam splitter where the photon basically goes in both directions simultaneously. So it, it, it becomes superposed across the two arms of the interferometer, then it gets absorbed either here or here, in which case it creates 
uh, an entangled state where one of the bacteria is entangled and the other one, uh, it's excited and the other one is not, plus vice versa. So in terms of qubits, this would be a state zero one plus one zero. And I think the question is, could we in principle do this experiment um, even with living systems? And, and, and I think this will define on the experimental side, um, maybe the next three to five years um, of what we are trying to achieve. Of course, there is a whole question of how then to engineer witnesses of entanglement and so on. But the goal here is really to quantum entangle two biological systems that are definitely alive. Um, I always say at this point that I would love to do this with coronavirus. I think um, it's high time that we had a revenge on corona for, for locking us in and keeping us down for a while. But I think coronavirus um, is on the big side. Um, and I think what we would rather do is, 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 is operate with a simpler system uh, that's actually easier to manipulate optically at this level. So unfortunately, it's not going to be Corona. It will be, it will be another, another living system. But I think any of them would be, would be spectacular to be able to do. Now, like I said, for the last bit, I want to... Uh, the message so far is I don't think quantum mechanics will fail in biology. I think quantum effects um, are, of course, more and more difficult to detect because of all sorts of decoherencies, couplings that we cannot control. But it seems to me um, that in order to understand biological systems and chemistry, uh, we may not need uh, new laws of physics. It seems to me unlikely that we will have to modify quantum mechanics at this level. One never knows, I hope, to be proven wrong. And I think this would be fantastic. Schrodinger, as you know, speculated that maybe we will need new laws of physics to understand biology. Nothing that we've done so far suggests this. Now, gravity, of course, um, the complexity for gravity, gravity is extremely simple compared to living systems. But what's difficult with gravity is that it's a very weak uh, force. Um, so the difficulty there is not that there are too many fiddly bits to control during your experiment, but the difficulty is, can I get a signal that's strong enough? And, and here is the usual argument that you will see. If you're thinking about um, matter coupling to light, then this is governed by the so-called fine structure constant, which is roughly uh, 1 over 137, right? It's one of those uh, famous magical numbers. So it's on the order of 10 to minus 2, if you like, a hundredth. And this alpha tells you how strongly uh, your atom, for instance, will, will spontaneously emit, how strongly it will couple to the neighboring um, electromagnetic field. Now, the corresponding um, fine structure constant for gravity and what this means is that if you excite an atom and you wait for a graviton to be emitted instead of a photon, which is what quantum gravity predicts, at least some versions of quantum gravity predict, you're going to have to wait um, some 43 orders of magnitude longer. So basically, if it takes a nanosecond for your atom to de-excite and emit a photon, it will take far, far longer than the age of the universe. I told you the age of the universe is 10 to 17 seconds. This would be something like 10 to the power of uh, 40 something seconds that you would have to wait to detect the graviton. So there are all sorts of papers even suggesting that you will never be able to do this. I think they're wrong because we have indirect ways of doing this, but this is just a very heuristic argument for why it's difficult. And you can do the same analysis for this spontaneous emission, I don't want to bore you with that. There is another actually argument, which, which is closely related to Marcus Arndt experiments I showed you at the beginning, which says the following. Um, um, imagine that you are doing um, an interference experiment of a complex molecule. 
And imagine that during your experiment, the molecule emits a graviton. And this graviton gives you the information as to whether the molecule goes through one slit or another slit or yet another slit and so on. So this would, of course, cause uh, the washing away of the interference uh, fringes. It would cause collapse because it would be equivalent to the which path information. So in this case, gravity would tell you which of the slits um, the molecule goes through, and therefore it would destroy diffraction. There is a very quick calculation that's done in this uh, Baim and Ozawa paper that I, that I cited in 2008, which says that if you have, this is very similar to what I said about Rosen and Paris conclusion. This says that if gravity leads to a collapse, then your interference fringes will be so small that they will be shorter, they will be smaller than Planck's length. So actually, this is another way of saying that it's very unlikely that we will ever be able to detect anything um, of this kind be because it requires either a spatial resolution that's extremely good or a temporal resolution, which we don't have and maybe we will never have. And there are all sorts of no-go arguments of this type. But what I want to tell you about now is what I think can be done. Uh, and then I'm gonna conclude uh, the whole thing. So basically, what we are doing are all sorts of interference experiments where you send a particle through two different um, modes, if you like. But now you should be thinking that this mode is at the higher level. So it's in a weaker gravitational field than this mode here. So this is really a vertical interferometer done on Earth, let's say, where the system in this path picks up one phase, but this path picks up a different phase because it's sitting in a different gravitational potential. So these are certainly the experiments that we can do. They have been done. And the question is, is there anything interesting that we can conclude from them? So one interesting thing already to do would be to really detect um, the time dilation um, um, which is simply the delay of clocks uh, which exist at two different heights um, in even in Earth's gravitational field. And we now have atomic clocks that are sensitive enough to do that. So actually you can go on YouTube and you can watch a video where an atomic clock is lifted by 10 centimeters. Um, and this is actually enough to change the rate so that you can see the last two digits of this atomic clock change. And this is because our atomic clocks are now as good as one part in 10 to the power of 18. So two order of magnitudes beyond what's required to detect the shift in Earth's gravitational field. But this is of course a completely classical shift the exciting thing to do is to put an atomic clock in a superposition of these two different heights and ask what's going to happen then. And there are all sorts of estimates that you can do in this case, and I, I'm not going to go too much into that. Now, what's exciting and what can always happen, and this is a different prediction uh, for these experiments, is that gravity will simply lead to collapse of superpositions. And if you put an atomic clock in a superposition in two different gravitational fields, then somehow gravity will so strongly interact with the superposition. That's what people like Joshi and Penrose and a number of others are, um, are betting on, if you like. The gravity will somehow, because it's effectively a classical uh, field, if you like a classical force, gravity will lead to uh, collapse of quantum mechanics. Um, what's interesting to people like me, actually, is that they could turn out to be right, but the gravitational field could still be quantum mechanical. And that's what I want to show you now, because the way we understand collapse of any um, quantum superposition is that the quantum system ends up coupling to its own quantum environment. So the question is whether even a collapse of quantum superposition, would that prove to us 
that quantum mechanics becomes classical due to interaction with gravity? Or would that actually prove that gravity itself is quantum mechanical? Here, I'm writing a very simple description of that, where I have a, a mass at two different positions at x and x plus a. And this alpha here is the coherent state that represents the state of the gravitational field. And if you treat this the same way that you treat electromagnetic phenomena, let's say in the linear regime, it's definitely sufficient to describe this. What you will get is, a, is that the mass at position X creates one kind of field, but ma mass at a different position creates a different kind of field. And if you wait long enough, and if your mass is big enough, it is possible that this gravitational field, even though it's fully quantum, actually entangles fully to the system and leads you to conclude that the system is now in a mixed state and can no longer interfere. So it's very difficult to, to rule these things out. Um, and there are all sorts of other things to do. Basically, the way we, uh, we deal with any of these things is really to, um, to, to test whether what we did can be reversed. So that means we create a superposition, we wait for a little bit, and then we try to undo the superposition. And then depending on what happens when we undo the superposition, depending on whether we can come deterministically back to the original state, we can then conclude whether something interfered with our system and the nature of that and so on. Again, to cut the long story short, and I think you will hear about these things from both Carlo and, and Sugato and, and many other people will be telling you about these things. If you do this experiment, but with two masses, you, you can see that there is a common theme to everything I say, that in order to really demonstrate quantumness, it's not enough to do superpositions usually with a single system. What you should really be aiming at is trying to entangle two different systems. And that's something I was proposing to do in biological systems, but it's also something that I'm proposing to be done to test gravity. It's a very sim similar logic that we are applying in both of these cases. So these are two different masses that are interfering through their own separate interferometers, max and the interferometers. But what happens on top of this is that each of these masses affects the other mass gravitationally. And what you really want to be able to claim at the end is that the two states, which are completely disentangled initially, end up being maximally entangled finally, only due to the interaction with gravity. And that's the exciting bit. And again, this slide, like I said, you will hear a lot more about this. And there are all sorts of um, subtleties there to explore. But I don't want to, at this level, discuss them because I think it will bore uh, most of you and it will miss the point. It gives you roughly the size of your masses, which I said here was, was a picogram. Just to tell you how far away, we are certainly 10 orders of magnitude away from being able to do something like this. But certainly the masses you need are smaller than the Planck's mass. Already uh, four to six orders of magnitude below Planck's mass, we will be able to tell whether gravity is quantum mechanical. So it tells you roughly the size of these interferences and the time scales that you need to, that you need to do. And the reason why this tests whether gravity is quantum mechanical is simply, again, speaking very crudely, gravity in this case is the channel that entangles two genuine quantum systems that are interfering. And what you can prove is that the only way that this channel can entangle two things is if the channel itself has quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. This experiment doesn't quite tell us what these degrees of freedom would be. For that, you need to apply a particular model. And certainly, linear quantum gravity would give you the relevant degrees of freedom. But what's exciting is that already this experiment, if you confirm the entanglement at the end, and if you could confirm that it really comes from gravity only, not from any other uh, interaction, then this would be an irrefutable way of proving 
quantumness, even of gravity at that level. This would certainly refute any collapse model, any semi-classical approach to quantum gravity, any field theory in curved space-time, as they call it, all of that would be out of the window. And, and, and I am betting that this is how it's gonna go. Um, it will be as boring as that in, 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 in a way uh, that, that it will just behave, I think, quantum mechanically. Of course, again, it would be exciting if something went wrong, it would force us to think much harder, but I doubt that anything uh, will happen at, um, at this level. Like I said, it's a difficult experiment, so I don't want to dwell too much on this. There are all sorts of suggestions not to do the experiment in the lab, but to do them on satellites to eliminate all sorts of other things to get two masses to interact in a free fall. And a friend of mine, Tomek Paterek, actually has written papers on this, that it may be better to to go into free space on satellites. There are all sorts of exciting ideas out there. But again, I believe that the progress has been so rapid that within um, 10 years, we will have an answer to this question as well. So I think it's a very exciting time to, uh, to really be a physicist. I think this is another popular coverage of this experiment, how you can get two vibrating gold nanospheres to actually um, try to get them entangled as far as their vibrations are concerned by using gravity. So they, they, they're, again, um, as soon as you propose something like this, you can immediately count on the ingenuity of experimental physicists who are actually coming up with all sorts of great ideas as far as I'm aware to really test this. And, and, and I'm very optimistic. Now, the last few slides. Um, speculating about the whole universe being quantum mechanical. There are many people who believe that there is a contradiction there. I don't think so. I think, I think the quantum reality is perfectly consistent. It's a self-consistent reality. It is very different to classical reality, as we all know, uh, but it is perfectly consistent. What I like about this uh, approach to treat everything quantum mechanically is that um, everything becomes described with exactly the same formalism. I, I like this unity because I don't like the distinction between the observer and the observed and so on. I, I don't think we need any observers uh, in physics or in quantum mechanics. They are completely uh, irrelevant and superfluous. And everything, all the observations, all the measurements can actually be accounted for through entanglements between one physical system, call it an observer, if you like, and another physical system, call it the system under investigation. So actually, the whole picture is very beautiful. Um, it, you, you just, of course, have to acknowledge that the elements of reality um, are not numbers. Um, elements of reality are uh, quantum observables. They are operators. They are matrices. And that's, of course, how our ultimate description in quantum field theory works. So the big jump we all have to make is that matrices form underlying reality. But once you, once you do that, everything is fine with relativity. We have no problems with locality. And like I said, we are even now investigating what happens in the case of gravity. So I took this from one of my popular talks, which is simply, um, um, an artist's impression of an experiment where a photon goes through an interferometer. And then I added this cat. It's a snow cat. I don't know if you can see it properly. Uh, it's a cat that's, that's basically dead in one branch here and alive in the other branch. Of course, quantum mechanically, this would be an entangled state between the path of the photon and the state of the cat. And then there is an observer that, that we call Bob, uh, who actually uh, splits, if you like, through observing this experiment. And there is a state of Bob where he's happy because he sees an alive cat. There is a sad state because he sees a, a dead cat. And then outside of the whole experiment is, is another physicist called Alice, who controls the whole experiment and as far as she's concerned, everything is one in one huge entangled state. And, and of course, this is now complete science fiction, but if quantum mechanics is correct at that level, she would in principle, at least if not in practice, 
be able to control all of these things, to interfere them, to undo them, and so on. So all of this can be tested. And all of this is consistent with quantum mechanics and with all the experiments that we've done. So the, the main message here is that quantum mechanics does give us an unusual picture of the universe, but it's not inconsistent. It's not contradictory in any sense of the word. So I think what I've described is what some people would call Wigner's friend, because Wigner worried a lot about these things. I think he reached the wrong conclusion himself, uh, or at least time will prove him wrong, I think. Um, because he thought that um, some kind of observation at the human level ultimately leads to collapse. But actually, as I've been presenting, um, all an observation is really is creation of entanglement between two physical systems. And there is nothing wrong with this. There's no need for anything to collapse. And all the observations could be consistently accounted for in this quantum universe. So um, you can extend, uh, you know, I'm using this Alice uh, in Wonderland kind of analogy to add many observers in this case. And there are many papers currently that you might be reading on all sorts of variants. What if this observer does this and observes that all of these accounts are perfectly consistent and can be explained quantumly. It's a magical theory. It always looks like something ought to go wrong but actually our intuition usually tricks us, if you like, and everything is beautifully consistent. It's a remarkable theory. So just leave you with these conclusions that quantum physics certainly seems to apply to large objects as well. It doesn't seem that we have an obvious limitation. Gravity could be a limitation, but we have absolutely no experimental reason to believe that this is the case. Nothing goes in principle, at least wrong when we quantize gravity. Um, some gravitational effects may be difficult to observe, as we said in the lab, but there is always hope that the universe itself, either early universe or astrophysical observations can help us there. And of course, the, the key question that unites all of this is what, what are the best ways of witnessing quantum effects um, by indirectly, as indirectly as possible, engaging with the system that we are probing. And it seems to me this will define, these kind of questions will define the whole research um, where quantum mechanics will leave the micro domain and be applied to the macro domain. I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Vlatko, for the great colloquium. We have some questions on the chat on YouTube. Can I read it to you? Uh, of course, please. OK. Uh, first one, Nathan asks, is, is the research involving bacteria going to teach us something about quantum mechanics? Is there any theoretical reason to think that quantum mechanics is different for lead or dead material? It's a great question. Uh, again, um, we don't know. I think that's precisely why we are doing it, because it's an open question. Uh, my uh, intuition is that um, it will not um, uh, force us to change quantum mechanics. Um, my bet will be more that we will be able to uh, maybe uh, contribute practically um, to biology in a sense that by changing the environment of this bacterium, what, what Dave and I wanted to do is to try to make the bacterium either more efficient at absorbing or less efficient at absorbing, depending on how strongly it's entangled to light. So actually, you could think of this as a new possible new technology in biology. And then as soon as you have that in mind, the question is, can you really simultaneously do this? You know, can you shift the bacterium so far out of resonance that it actually can no longer do photosynthesis? This would be, this would be a quantum way of killing the, the bacterium, if you like. Um, 
bactericide, quantum bactericide, I suppose. And um, the question there is, could you actually um, um, shift it in and out of resonance simultaneously so that you can test uh, Schrodinger's experiment with the bacterium? That's what I think is exciting. But I'm really betting on quantum mechanics. I think quantum mechanics already accounts for this very beautifully. Um, David asks, uh, do you think that macroscopic beginner friend type of experiments would be a fruitful future avenue of investigation? And he complement if you can comment on the technical challenge for beginner type of experiments. The technique, I think it's definitely worth doing it. I, um, I end up talking to all sorts of adventurous um, neuroscientists about that as well, because ultimately, of course, the holy grail would be to really um, try to work with human perception. I mean, that, that's, that's ultimately, uh, of course, better than Schrodinger's cat, because with a human, you can interact, you can ask them about that. It's very difficult to communicate with cats. I mean, I love cats, but, but I'm not able to communicate with them. So ultimately, I think what you want to do is some kind of quantum experiment that involves human perception. Uh, we are extremely far away from that. That's not the first thing that you would do. Um, what I believe um, will be the most fruitful thing to do and, and, and least challenging is to actually do this kind of experiment with a kind of computer. So some kind of programmed, very small, level quantum computer, almost like it doesn't have to be artificial intelligence. It only needs to be able to really couple to another quantum system, record the result, and then be able to read out uh, the result when asked. So it seems to me Vigna's friend will first be done by some kind of quantum computational device. Um, then, of course, we can do this with biological systems. But like I said, with biological systems, um, it's hard to see. I think the most exciting thing, obviously, is to really uh, probe what it is, if anything, um, that this system feels uh, when undergoing some kind of um, interference experiment. And that's what Wigner had in mind. Wigner thought, surely, um, a conscious being will never be able uh, to process an entangled state because for our consciousness, we need things to be in a definitive state. Um, but I think, I think he was wrong about this conclusion in the sense that um, even thinking of everything being quantum mechanical and entangled still gives you definitive states. The only thing that it allows you on top to do, which Vigna would de deny presumably, is that you can reinterfere these possibilities and then check the outcome. And I think this would be fantastic. So if if you know there, there are some papers written by, by physicists that um, that um, that molecules in our brain uh, could have quantum states um, which could even be coherent um, in terms of uh, superposition of two spin states, let's say. Um, for up to 24 hours. And I think if any of these um, uh, claims are legitimate, and if any of this could be used for some kind of storage uh, device for our memory and our perception, then I think it would be interesting to explore these things. I mean, at, at present, this is complete science fiction. No one knows how to do anything, but I do think that this is an exciting thing to think about. And I think a genuinely multidisciplinary research will be required here uh, because um, neuroscientists, biologists, and chemists will have to bring in their own techniques and understanding and then put it together with what we understand from quantum physics. So, so I, I like this direction a lot. Pedro asks, what is the decurrence time in the bacteria system? Ah, good, good, good question. Actually, these are, that particular transition um, was very, very rapid. 
Um, so we are talking about um, um, certainly picoseconds uh, time scales. Um, if we if we want to improve this, uh, so what you should contrast this is, for instance, if we want to do a genuine Rabi flopping experiment, if you want to drive the two levels in a coherent quantum mechanical way, the question is how many coherent flops, how many not gates, speaking as a, as a quantum computer, so how many not gates can I get before the system decoheres? And I think the answer in this case is very few. You could see maybe a few oscillations, but they would very quickly decay. Um, if you go for a simpler organic molecule, you could push this um, two or three orders of magnitude longer. You could go maybe to nano second time scales, but even then, uh, again, you have to contrast this to the gate time. Uh, so decoherence is certainly a major obstacle here. Um, and, and the problem, and I think this is a great question because where this will affect us is basically that whatever experiment we do um, to be able to confirm that the living systems are entangled will have to happen on the time scales that are faster than the decoherence. And I think this is a major challenge. And you will see this um, in any direction, anyone who's worked with uh, trying to entangle, let's say, two uh, diamonds, two crystals, will be facing exactly the same problem. The, the, the decoherence times are very quick. Uh, Eduardo asks, uh, is it still impossible for gravity to be fundamentally quantum if we don't observe quantum effects of gravity in this experiment that you propose it? Oh, that's also a great question, actually. I, I like that uh, because I keep emphasizing that, um, that showing entanglement um, um, certainly rules out many theories. But the question that Eduardo is asking is, if you don't show entanglement, is it possible that it's still quantum mechanical? And the answer is yes, um, of course. Uh, that is always possible. So this witness um, only works in a sufficient way, um, in the sense that when you demonstrate something, it's sufficient to, to confirm it. But if you don't, this could be for, for a number of different reasons, actually, and some of them um, may even have to do with how gravity works. So it's perfectly possible that the different degrees of freedom of the gravitational field are still quantum mechanical and that we won't be able to observe entanglement in this. It, it's compatible. It's a great question. And the last one, Ricardo asks, can you elaborate a little bit on why people think treating the whole universe as a quantum state is inconsistent? And what is your counter argument to them? It's a, it's a great question. Actually, this almost requires another talk. And, uh, and I'm very happy to, um, to engage at a different stage. This is something I, I discuss with many people and certainly my whole group actually is is always excited about, about these questions. Um, some people think that um, some classical principles will have to fail if the universe is fully quantum mechanical. So if you ask about inconsistencies, different people would tell you that different things are inconsistent. Some people believe that different observers will disagree about their observations. And they will disagree in a way that quantum mechanics cannot predict. Um, and there are all sorts of, I think this is completely wrong, by the way. I should immediately say that none of these arguments make sense as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's one possibility in which, in which they are inconsistent. So they're thinking that Wigner's friend will somehow be inconsistent um, in the sense that um, one friend will communicate that they've seen let's say zero state to another friend, whereas what they've really seen is a state one. Those are the kind of um, contradictions that, uh, that people have in mind. That's one kind of contradiction. Um, another kind of contradiction is that people believe that all sorts of classical principles, namely 
usually conservation laws, you can think of the equivalence principle um, along the same lines. Uh, people think that when these things are quantized, um, uh, then some of these principles will break down. Um, I suspect um, Roger Penrose, in fact, uh, frequently uses the equivalence principle from classical gravity as being responsible um, for the collapse of quantum superpositions. Now, as far as I looked into these things, um, all of it seems perfectly consistent to me. Um, it's a question of, of course, of um, specifying how these principles are to be understood within quantum mechanics. But once you define this appropriately, and there is an appropriate definition, then I think there is nothing contradictory here at all. Um, like I said, it, it is unusual that if you do this to the whole universe, it seems that um, you never get definitive outcomes. So uh, the concept of measurement simply disappears. The, there are no measurements in the quantum universe. Um, everything is simply an interaction between different physical systems. So, so the born the born rule, the mod psi squared postulate is not needed actually at the level of the universe. It's superfluous, uh, which is an interesting one. And I think that makes many people nervous as well. Many people think this can't be the case that that this is not needed. But uh, you know, having looked into these things in great detail, I actually think that there is nothing um, contradictory about it. Uh, so there are all sorts of things where classical concepts are ge generalized to quantum mechanics and then people think that something goes wrong. And this, of course, the final thing I want to say should be contrasted with people who claim that quantum mechanics will fail. Uh, that is a completely different thing and it's perfectly logically possible that quantum mechanics will fail. In fact, I'm hoping desperately that it fails because it always leads to many, many more interesting questions when something fails in physics. My guess is that the way in which it will fail is that the next theory will be even more counterintuitive. So we are, we are not going to go from entanglement to no entanglement. We are going to go to, to super entanglement. Things are going to be even more unusual, even more different from classical reality. And we will have a theory in which quantum physics is just a special case, the same way that gravity becomes a special case. Um, and the, the way the classical physics is a special case of quantum mechanics. So I'm also hoping for the next theory. I'm hoping something interesting happens, but I think it's gonna go in the exact opposite direction. It's gonna be even more unusual than quantum mechanics. It's just my guess. Uh, Nathan asks, you did not discuss the problem of quant quantizing GR using the methods of quantizing electromagnetism. electromagnetism. Uh, I mean, that GR is non renormalizable Does this okay. give any insights to testing quantum gravity? This is a great question as well. And I think um, at the level that I was describing, this is not a problem at all, of course. We are working at the lowest um, Newtonian um, approximation. So it's really Newtonian gravity um, imposed on, on superposed quantum objects. The only difference being that the Newtonian field is still propagated causally at the speed of light. So it's Newton, but Newton interpreted um, in Maxwell's way, if you like, which is why all of this uh, works very beautifully. So at this level, we don't need to go beyond um, the lowest approximations. Um, if you now go in the opposite regime where both quantum mechanics and gravity may be equally important and people almost immediately talk about black holes in this regime, then of course, this is a very different question. Uh, then non-renormalizability may be an issue. We don't know how to deal with that. I usually think of all field theories as, as effective theories. And it seems to me that um, problems that people um, associate with quantum gravity are simply problems that we have with field theory in general. 
Um, so I have a feeling that something in field theory will be modified before we even have the full understanding or maybe together with the full understanding of quantum gravity. So I'm perfectly happy with an effective description that only works at a certain level. The fact that all of these um, amplitudes add up to a nonsensical answer um, is, is not of my concern. Actually, I, I don't think that's a big issue. Um, I think that points uh, to possibly uh, finiteness of space or time or something else that we will realize, which, like I said, will lead us to change field theory in general, rather than just um, quantum gravity. So, so I'm not overly bothered about it. But like I said, we do not have a way um, of, of talking about, let's say, um, physics of the black holes um, in any coherent way because of the problem that you just raised. Thanks, Professor, for the colloquium and for the answers. Uh, we think uh, we can end this part of the colloquium. Also, thanks for all the, all the questions in the chat on YouTube. Now we are coming back to Zoom to graduate student, students discuss directly with Professor Vlatko. Great, thank you.